Amen. As we're in 1 Chronicles 22, and I mentioned earlier, continuing with this theme from the funeral yesterday, I want to tell you a story from my personal past. About 20 years ago, there was a young man I knew. His name was Kent. He was a brother in Christ, and we first met in church as teenagers at a First Baptist church, and he seemed like a, like a pretty good guy. Later in life, we were reintroduced. Uh, we met again in college. Many years had passed, and we were kind of on different paths in life. I remember Kent's dad, Kent was a motorhead. His dad was a motorhead. He was all about fixing up old cars and restoring them. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But they together spent many hours specifically on one project. Kent, when I met him again in college, as our paths departed and then reunited, he now drove a green two-door Dodge. I believe it was a Challenger with black stripes on it. As many motorheads would say, it was a fine automobile. It was quite the machine. It was literally a trophy winner. They had invested a lot of time together, hours, working on this project. The, the car itself sort of had this surreal presence when you would stand next to it as it was running and you could just hear this engine, oh, bum, 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 bum. like it was, just, it was just hungry and ready to go. It was quite the machine. They invested countless hours together in the evenings working on this machine, rebuilding it, repairing it, replacing the seals, the rubber, the electrical, literally everything. They together built it from the frame, rebuilt it back up, they supercharged it. Many a nights they spent in their garage. He had a full garage at his house. It was a total rebuild. It was exceedingly magnificent. It was amazing. There was just something about that machine. In college, he quickly became one of the most popular guys, probably partly because of that automobile. It was an awesome car. Now at the time, my first car, we literally pulled it out of the junkyard and we put a transmission in it to get it running. And uh, it was two-tone also, because I had to spray paint the hood and the rims, you know. <laughs> Needless to say, we were on a different path. He was one of the coolest kids and he had one of the hottest rides. He was probably one of the fastest drivers. He was so popular that everybody wanted to be around him. In fact, everybody, wanted Kent at their party. It was just something to have that machine come rolling up. Well, of course, when you start hanging around parties, you start drinking. Kent was going on the wrong path, and everybody knew it. Soon he started dating a very popular girl. His girlfriend, she was a volleyball player or volleyball or cheerleader, something like that. I don't remember that detail, but everybody knew who she was and what was going on with her and Kent. And she ended up getting him hooked on pills. You could see the joy had left Kent as you would see him. He was fatigued and tired, discouraged in certain ways, but you, when you're hooked on pills and weed and drinking and the party life and everybody expects something from you, it was just sad. You could see the lack of joy in his face. One night after dropping her off on his way home after a storm, an entire road had washed out and he hit it so fast. That was his end. It was his demise. As far as I know, I'll see Kent when I get to heaven. They had to have a closed casket. That beautiful machine sat up on a hill next to his dad's house for many years. I, I've wondered about it. I imagine if we go back on Google Maps, you can look at history. I wonder if I could go see a picture of that. He set that car there for a while because I wonder if his dad felt like 
there's still a value to that motor we put in and that machine and maybe I'll rebuild it one day. Or maybe his dad was broken hearted because he had prepared his son to be the coolest motorhead instead of preparing his son to live for God. It breaks my heart when I think about it. They couldn't have an open casket. The whole community mourned. Later I ran into his girlfriend and she was not the same. She was definitely damaged because of it all. His father had not prepared him to serve the Lord. He had prepared him to serve his lust. You're in 1 Chronicles 22. I want you to look at the last phrase in verse number 5. Look at verse number 5. Look at the last sentence. It says, So David prepared abundantly before his death. Now, David was wise at this point in his life. He was an old man. He had seen a lot. He had fought a lot. And he knew it was time to prepare. And I want to encourage you uh, to prepare for your death. If this sermon had a title, it would be that. Prepare for your death. There are phrases all throughout the Bible. Uh, set your house in order or prepare to meet thy God. Right? Uh, your days are numbered. Your days are limited. One day we must all stand before your Creator. And then what will you say? I want to encourage you to consider your ways and consider your time and consider what you care about now so that you don't have a casket full of regrets. Oh, if only I had spent more time with my family. If only I had worked a little less. If only I had taken them to church and taught them the Bible. If only I had searched after the Lord instead of my own lust. I do believe that preparing for death in a physical sense is very important. About three years ago, my first time being in this church building, I uh, heard a preacher, Pastor Palacios, speaking on the topic of the widow's son. And in that story, you probably know the story where Elisha worked a miraculous miracle by praying to God. There was this widow. It says she was a wife of the sons of the prophets. Okay, so he worked for God and he died and he had not prepared to take care of his wife. So she came crying to Elisha saying, don't you know we served God and we were in the ministry and I have nothing and the creditors are come and they want to take my two sons to pay the bills. And of course the story goes, he said, go and borrow vessels, not a few, and she borrowed a bunch of pots, and all she had was a little bit of oil, and she poured it all out into all those vessels. It was a miraculous thing, and he said, go and sell the oil, pay off your debt, and, and live on that. That sermon always stuck with me because I have to take care of my wife when I pass. Statistically speaking, men go first, don't they? I do believe it's wise to prepare for your death while you're alive, both physically and spiritually. It's wise, and I, I'm not going to give you counseling or advice, and some people like insurance, some don't. Uh, some people just say, I'm, I'm saving, or others say, I'm investing, I'm making plans for retirement. Uh, some people put it in Bitcoin, which I don't know, I've still never held a Bitcoin, not sure what that's all about, right? Uh, but I do think it's important to take care of this business so that you don't leave somebody else in a mess. I've actually worked at a funeral home when I was a teenager. Um, actually, at that very time that I knew Kent, I worked at a funeral home, and I learned a few things, is that when death comes, it doesn't matter how smart you are, or how beautiful you are, or how many other plans you have, it doesn't matter if you're young or old. I remember our funeral home one time, we had three funerals in the same day. A drunk driver came over the hill early in the morning and hit two teenagers on their way to school that morning. I saw his body. He is what we call a crispy critter. 
He was so charred, he was beyond recognizable. There was another thing that they brought us, the coroner, and it, it was in a bag, and we're trying to figure out, it's just a chunk, it looked like a, a piece of, looks like dad was cooking the hamburgers too long. I mean, it was charred, and we figured out there's a quarter in it. Oh, that's his wallet. His wallet that he sat on was so charred by fire, you, it was unidentifiable. You couldn't tell what it was. It was just melted and burnt. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, it would do you well to make some plans for your end, for your death, both physically and spiritually. In fact, Sister Tina and I were talking yesterday after the funeral at that uh, her son, when he passed, he had a piece of property and it's been tied up in probate for over a year. And it's not going anywhere but in family. And they're like, well, the government's going to get involved and get their hands in it and they're going to delay the process. And, and, and so there are things that you can do now to avoid physical problems when you passed. I believe we should have a last will and a testament to say, this is what I want and this is how it should go and make it clear. I think you should have a living will, which is to say, if I black out, you know, either do resuscitate me or don't, or here's what I want. Um, some people have some thoughts on that as well. I just want to ask you, have you prepared your house? I tell you, this really hits home because uh, I thought about this. I knew I would preach this sermon. I knew it was coming up, and we just recently drove several hours north to Jacksonville, North Carolina, to preach a revival for a little vacation. And I was thinking about it before we left. It's like, I need to leave a note that if I die, I want to know that my kids are in the right hands, that they're in church, that they're taken care of. I don't want any questions of the state coming in and saying, well, we'll take them for a little while and give them to strangers, and hopefully they don't mess them up, and then maybe they'll go back where you want them to go. So, you know, that's one of those things that was on my mind recently. Preparing for your death, preparing for when you pass, is for the living, it's not for the deceased at all. In fact, I think it's one of the greatest acts of love. It's the final act of love is to prepare for those that you leave behind. If you will, let's read 1 Chronicles 22, verse number 5. And David said, My son is young and tender, and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent." of fame and glory throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. I want to shift gears for a second, and I want to stop talking about your physical funeral. I'd like to take the rest of the time and ask you to prepare for your death spiritually. I want you to notice the phrase here that he says, My son is young and tender. Now, David was an old guy, and he had a young son, and he knew, uh, well, we need to build the house of the Lord. And I want you to use that illustration, not for building these walls. Don't worry about these walls. God will take care of them. But I want you to use this as an illustration for you to build the spiritual house. I want you to focus now while your children are yet young and tender. Or perhaps you're a young adult and still somewhat young and somewhat tender. Build your house of the Lord, which is your body and your family, and make plans now. Prepare now for your death. What kind of an inheritance, spiritually speaking, are you going to leave behind? Whenever I pass, whether or not there's money in the account or vehicles in the yard or food in the fridge, I would just ask God that there's faith in their hearts. That would be the number one priority. That is the absolute most important thing that we give a spiritual heritage to those that we leave behind, that they would see the value of trusting in the Lord for salvation, and then, Lord willing, maybe even building a house for Him in their own life. Are you working on your house? Are you building your life to be a house of the Lord? Are you preparing for your death? Spiritual preparation while you're st still yet young. Now, if you're still on earth, and I don't know who's the oldest in here. If I had to guess, there's probably somebody near 80. Is anybody over 80? One, at least. <laughs> 
I saw another hand go up, but I'll disagree with that one. All right. Uh, are you, who's over 70? One, two, three, four, five. I see you holding his arm up, nudging him. Six, seven, okay. So we, we've got a few that are over 70. Now, in the big picture of eternity, you are still young. There's still time. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. There's time where you can build a spiritual house and you can give faith to your family and take a stand and build a foundation that they can build a house on. If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 5. I want to share with you our daily proverb, as I often encourage in church, Read your daily proverb, right? Well, today's remember, remember, the 5th of November. Why? Well, I want you to build your spiritual house. I want you to prepare for death spiritually now. What are you leaving behind? What is your reputation? Are you sharing your faith with others? In Proverbs chapter 5, If you would, look at verse number 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to my understanding. This is written from a father to a son. And listen, ladies, you're not off the hook. It's for you too. It applies to you. Uh, here, we're passing down some wisdom. Let me tell you what I've learned so you don't make the same mistakes. Verse 2 that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Here's the goal is to be discreet in our life and keep the words of God in our heart. Verse 3, For the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. I often think of this young man, Kent, that I met earlier that I was talking about. If it wasn't for that woman that he started running with, would he still be alive? Verse 4, But her end is bitter, as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword, her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. What this is teaching is, uh, young ladies and young men, is there is a type of person out there that as you draw nigh to them and you want to get close to them and you think you're in love with them, uh, you know, my dad used to say, you're in heat. He, <laughs> you're not in love, you're in heat, okay? Right? And listen, the, the human body has these emotions and desires, and we have to learn to control it so it doesn't control us, and we make a bad mistake. And he says, look out, there's a type of a person that you may think would make a good spouse, but they're going to take you to the path toward hell. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, but maybe they're on that path, and you would look like them on that path. He says, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, and so that you can't just stop and meditate on the Lord. Their ways are movable. There's always some drama, something changing, something messing with your mind. There's a lot of young people out there that if you spent time with them, you probably wouldn't have any peace. Verse 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Now, children is men and women, so you young ladies and old ladies and young men and old men, everyone pay attention, please. Verse 8, remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house, lest thou give thine honor to others and thy years unto the cruel. There are some times you invest, pe invest in other people and you're just paying for their sin and you can't save anything because you're throwing money away. Yeah. Verse 10, Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. Well, you know what happens with that lifestyle is you end up getting a disease or uh, hurting yourself or something, right? Verse 12, and I say, How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? Here's the problem is usually it's a rebellious heart. 
A young man will set off in the wrong direction and they say, no, no, I'm running in that way and I'm chasing this and I'm after pleasure and I'm living for lust and they stop living for the Lord. Verse 13, And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instruct me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. This verse has always blown my mind. We're talking about somebody that is so given to the lust of the flesh that while they're sitting in church with God's people, their mind is somewhere else. Sometimes that means they're like sinning while they're here. In the church, I was, and you can apply that to drunkenness, to those that are on pills, or, or to those that uh, can't you know, think straight because they were drunk the, the night before, or those that are lusting and coveting while they sit in church, or those that are fornicating and they bring their fornication partner with them. I mean, what a, what a thought that God is just kind of warning you here. Be careful, be careful. Here's the end result that you would actually sin against your own conscience and do it openly in front of everybody in the church. We talked about the sin unto death this past Wednesday. In Proverbs 5, look at verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. God sees all you do. He thinks about all you do. He knows what you're thinking, where you're going, where you've been, and what you're up to. This is very important. God is considering your end. Look at verse 22. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. You know what he's saying? If you live a life of sin, it's going to catch up. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he shall go astray. This again reminds me of my friend Kent that died young. He died early. As a Christian living in sin, the Lord took him home. If you would, go back to 1 Chronicles 22. Go back to 1 Chronicles 22. I want you going back there. Go back there. No. First Chronicles chapter 22. Let's pick up where we left off in verse number 6. Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build an house for the Lord God of Israel. I want you to know there's two aspects here of what the fathers did. Now, he called and he charged. Now, this is a responsibility that every parent has. As a parent, you must tell your child, you must call them, and then charge them. Now, to charge them means to give them a set of instructions. When you go to war, they give you charges. Like, here's where you're going, here's what you're doing, here's your mission, here's your post, here's your responsibility, you will do this, you won't do that, right? It's all encapsulated, right? Now, as a parent... A Christian parent, it's your job to go to your child, young or old, and say God's will for your life is that you would build the house, which is your life, your body. You build your own life to be the house of the Lord. I'm going to call you, and I'm going to charge you. Look at verse number 11. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he hath said of thee. Here's the key. If we're going to have any prosperity in our life while we're here, we need God to go with us. If you're going to be successful spiritually in your life, and especially in the next generation, we need God's blessing on our life to give us direction, to open doors for us. He says, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord. And that's what I want to encourage you, is build the house of the Lord in your own heart. I want you to consider that this is the temple of the God, of God. It's your body. And your body, you have the ability to obey God or to disobey God, and your choices will affect how much God can use you. 
the sermon is about preparing for your death. And if we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, are you preparing for that now? In verse 12, he continues, he says, Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. And boy, I tell you, we need that, don't we? That's why I encourage you guys to read Proverbs every day. We need wisdom and understanding from the Lord. He says, And give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God, that then thou shalt prosper, and if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments with the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. So he says, okay, keep the law, take heed to fulfill the statutes. If you really want God's blessing on your life, guys, it's simple. We have to obey. When you disobey, you will be corrected. When you obey, you will be blessed and rewarded. Notice he says, Then thou shalt prosper, verse 13, if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. And then he says, Be strong. And parents, I want to give you this encouragement. Be strong. You know, it's easier to make friends with your children than to be a godly parent. You know, it's easier to let them sin against you than to be strong and correct them. You know it's true. You know, as a father, it's easier to just be lackadaisical and not take a stand. But God says, be strong. And ladies, you know, it's easier to just give in to the flesh and, uh, you know, do it your way or whatever and go against the will of the Lord. But God says, be strong. And if we're going to be successful in the next generation, if we're going to prepare for what's coming next, we must be strong now. And God's given you everything you need to be strong. He says, be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. He says, be courageous. He says, dread not. That means don't be afraid of, oh no, what if I do that? No, no, just trust the Lord and do the hard things. He'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you the understanding. He's already given you the commandments, the law, the statutes. You know what you need to do. Now be strong, have courage, encourage others to do the same, and you will prosper. That's His promise. He says, you will prosper. Look at verse 16. Of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and of the iron, there is no number. Arise, therefore, and be doing. I love this. And what's he say? Be doing. Now think about it. What are you kids doing? I, I said, get to work. Right? Now, now think about it. This is David speaking to his son. You want God to prosper you or it won't work. He'll give you the wisdom if you obey him. Don't disobey him. He'll correct you. And he says to be doing. Hold your finger here for one second and go to John 1, or uh, um, uh, James 1. Go to James 1. He says, be doing and the Lord be with thee. I want you to think about what do you do? What are you known for? Uh, someone asked me yesterday, what, it, what does law of liberty mean? What, what does your church stand for? And I say, well, the simple answer is, the law of liberty is the Word of God. That's the easy answer, but it's a little bit deeper than that. Let me show you. In James chapter 1, look at verse number 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your souls. Okay, so he says, Receive the Word. We get that. The engrafted Word, it can save your soul. But sometimes to receive the Word, first we have to put away the naughtiness and the superficial and the excess and the partying and the selfishness and the lasciviousness, right? He says, so get rid of that stuff and get the Word. Now, I remind you that the book of James is written to somebody that's already saved. They're already saved. Verse 22, be not a doer, I'm sorry, verse 20, he says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now think about that. There are a lot of people today, and they are hearers, but not doers. Oh yeah, I hear the Bible all the time. I get it on my phone. It popped up, and I looked at it before I swiped it away and went back to Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, TikTok, 
Twitter, X, whatever they call it, right? We've got so many distractions, we're not even hearing the word hardly, but then when we do hear the word, we're filtering it through our own selfish desire instead of saying, whatever I hear, I need to do. Now listen, he says elsewhere, when you come to the house of God, that you need to be ready to hear. Why? Because we need to be ready to do. When you come to church, I want you to come with the attitude, not of, well, he better, he better really make me happy today. Is this, when's, how long is he going to go on? No, you need to come here and say, Lord, give him a message for me. Yeah. It's interesting that Wednesday night, I had three or four people that specifically reached out and said, you have no idea what you said was just for me. I didn't say it, but my thought was, me too, brother, amen. When we come to the house of the Lord, we need to be ready to receive the word, to hear the word, so we can do the word. If you really want God to bless you in your life as you prepare for your death, let's be doers of the word. Look what he says. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his fa natural face in a glass. This is talking about a mirror. Okay, when you look in the Bible, and God says, do this, don't do that, and you don't do it. Yeah, I heard it, but I'm not going to do it. It's like a guy that goes and looks in a mirror. Oh, man, have I always been that ugly? <laughs> Ooh, that's messed up. Why, well, why didn't somebody tell me I got these problems that I need to deal with, right? Look what he says. Verse 24, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way. And straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. What do you say? Doesn't he say in Isaiah 53 that everyone's gone their own way? Right? My friend Kent that I'm talking about that I'll probably see in heaven one day, you know what? We were going in different ways. And he went his own way. He took his own path. And he thought partying was the most important thing he could do with his time. He thought uh, cranking on that motor and upgrading it and doing all these things to his car was the most important thing that he could do at that time. He was so invested into that, he had blinders on to the Word of God that he couldn't, he couldn't care about going to church. He was focused on the things of the world. He was looking in the mirror he didn't care what he saw. Verse 25, this is where this is the verse we get the name of the church from. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, right? So you open the Bible, you see what it says. And continueth therein. Well, that means you do what it says. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Here's God's promise. To be saved, it requires zero works. It re it's all faith. But once you're saved, when you see the Word of God, and you do the Word, you do the work, then you get a blessing. Yeah. You want to prosper in your life, as David told his son as he prepared for his death? Do the Word. Do the work. Be doing, he said. While we're in James, go to James chapter 2. Look at James chapter 2. I want to show you the same, same thought. A doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So how ought we to live? James 2 verse 12. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Speak and do. You know what we call that? That's our walk and our talk. Okay, you're saved by faith. What should we do? I'll tell you what you do. You walk and you talk like you're going to be judged by this book in eternity. And God has made certain promises that if you'll prepare your house now, and you'll build a spiritual house now, while you're young and tender, you make plans to serve the Word of God. You want to look inside of it. You want to do what it says. You want to walk that way and talk that way. God says, don't you worry about the rest. I will bless you. As Christians, how should we live? As those that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Right. It weighs heavy on my heart as I think about my friend that passed. There were other friends in that same church that 
I have worse stories about. We weren't even in that church for that long. I just want to encourage you, and I, I want to end the sermon now. I just, I just, I want you to consider your time. David made plans for his son. He said, my son is young and tender. It said, so David prepared abundantly before his death. If you don't prepare for your death now, it may take you by surprise. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. and Lord, I just ask that you would use this Scripture today to touch our heart. Lord, I ask that you would use it to motivate us, to encourage us, and remember that we are frail, we are but dust, our days are limited, and we don't know when we're going to go. Lord, we can know for sure where we're going by calling on your name in faith and trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we should take the gift of God, which is eternal life, and then we should walk and talk like we're going to be judged by the law of liberty. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be different. I pray that you would help us to be unique. I pray that you would help us to be your children. Lord, we need your help to have a good reputation in a dark time. Lord, I pray for the children that are here. I pray that you would help us to make plans to raise them for you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.